The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant good evening to you wherever you may be. The F&M Schaefer Brewing Company raises a cold glass of Schaefer beer in your honor, and lucky strikes blowing smoke rings at you from the studios of Comfortably Zone Radio. And it's time for Dodgers baseball, a tale of two cities from Brooklyn to Los Angeles. I'm your host, Peter Trunk, and my co-host is Ron Rabinovitz. Ron, how are you tonight? Good. How are you, Peter? I'm doing fine. A little bit cold, but... That's from yeah. New Jersey. You're out in Minneapolis. That's even colder where you are. It's right today. It's right now. It's 12 degrees above zero. Oh, above it's zero. Above you're having a heat wave. Yeah. What? Yeah, we're yeah. having a heat wave. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's about, yeah. it's about the same here. 12 degrees. But it's been below zero for for several days. Oh boy! Oh, oh. boy! Oh boy! Yeah, I'm ready for yeah. spring. I'm ready for Spring baseball training. myself. What is it? Me too, 50 buddy. days, 48 days, 46 days to yeah. pitchers and catchers, something like that. It's I can't not wait. Too, it's I can't. not too damn long, that's for sure. No, and, it sure uh, is. I will welcome it with open arms this year. Me too. Open you know, arms. I'm a little concerned before we go on it. I'm a little concerned sure. about the Dodgers right now because they haven't done much in free agency or anything. No, uh, they're not doing anything. I think they're saving their no. pennies for next year. Well, I don't know. The Rockies are improving. The Diamondbacks are improving. The Giants improved. Yeah. Well, and they're sitting. They're sitting uh, still. The only thing. The only thing that has me worried about the Dodgers, and it's pretty important. But the only thing that has me worried is how they're going to replace Brandon Morrow. Right. Who they're going to replace him right. with. That's the key for yeah. me. But um, Who did they signed today. They they signed some guy today, who was cut by the Brewers. Yeah. Um, he only had like 16 in the third innings pitched last year. He uh-huh. was injured. But the Dodgers seem to like that he has a very sharp breaking uh, slider, and that yeah. he can really bring it. He can throw really hard. So they figure Honeycutt can teach him to go up the ladder and. <laughs> Whatever you know, who knows? I don't know. Right. I don't know right. what they're doing. They, they're they're dumpster diving most of the winter this year. <laughs> You're right. But you know right. what? Honeycutt's amazing. Yeah, he Honeycutt is. Honeycutt is amazing. Yeah. He is amazing. Oh. However, I don't. I still hold one big, uh, heavy mark against him, and that is why he couldn't ascertain what you Darvish was doing wrong in the World Series right, when right. other people were reading his pitches. How that yeah. escaped Honeycutt is beyond me. I don't um, know either. Other than that, I don't, you know, who knows. I don't know, but uh, we'll see. We shall see, you know. we get right. we've got to count exactly. the days, wait for the snow to melt. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to start off in Brooklyn. Uh, I want to talk about a guy uh, who was the youngest player ever to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was inducted in 1972. He was only 36 years old, the youngest player ever to be inducted. He was a pitcher. He won three Cy Young Awards. He was the first pitcher ever to win three Cy Young Awards, and this was back when Major League Baseball gave the Cy Young Award to one pitcher, not uh, not one from right. the National League and one from the American League, but one pitcher. One. And one this pitcher. guy won three of them. He was the first one to win three of them. In those three years that he won the Cy Young, 1963, 1965, and 1966, he also won what's known as the Pitcher's Triple Crown those three years. He led the league in wins, strikeouts, and earned run average. Um, he was a six-time All-Star. Yep. Uh, he was the first pitcher to throw four no-hitters. Yep. And he is one of four pitchers in the Baseball Hall of Fame 
who have more strikeouts than innings pitched. And his name is Sandy Koufax. He wore number 32. Hey. And uh, he actually, he was born Sanford Braun, B-R-A-U-N. He was born in, in Brooklyn, and he was raised in Borough Park. His parents were divorced when uh, he was three years old. And his mom remarried a uh, lawyer named Irving Koufax when Sandy was nine years old. And he adopted him. Irving adopted Sandy, and Sanford Braun became Sanford Koufax at age nine. He uh, wow. attended Lafayette High School in Brooklyn, where uh, actually Sandy was better known for basketball, believe it or not. At the time, uh, when, when Koufax first went to Lafayette High School, believe it or not, they had no sports programs at all because uh, – New York City teachers refused to supervise extracurricular activities without getting paid. So instead of going on strike, the teachers just said, we're not going to coach and we're not going to stay after school, et cetera, if we don't get paid. So Lafayette High School, for a time, uh, when Sandy first got there, had no, um, had no sports. So mm -hmm. what did Sandy do? Sandy... Uh, he played basketball for the Jewish Community Center uh, called the Jewish good, Community House of Bensoners. That's where he went to play basketball. And he was pretty good, wasn't he? Oh, boy, was he good. Eventually, yeah. Lafayette had a basketball team. Uh -huh. uh, the teachers, teachers settled. They got paid. And uh, Koufax became captain in his senior year uh, of the – Lafayette High School basketball team, and he ranked second in their division in scoring. So he was wow. quite a basketball player. For sure. Uh, was he a guard tonight? or a forward? I you don't know. know. He, since, since, we, since we know that he was over six feet tall, Sandy was what, 6'2", 6'3"? 6'2", I think. Yeah, 6'2". Well, back in 1951, that was pretty tall. So I'm yeah, not so sure right. if he was a guard. He was probably a he yeah. was a probably a forward. Forward, probably um, forward. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Sure, he wasn't a center, but he was probably a forward. Yeah, yeah. probably a forward. Uh, yeah. In uh, 51, 1951, Koufax also joined the local youth baseball league. Get this: the league was known as the Ice Cream League. That was the name ice of the cream league. league. The Ice Cream <laughs> League. Yeah. He started out, believe it or not, you're going to laugh at this one. He started out as a left-handed catcher. Really? Yeah, a left-handed catcher. Never knew that. Neither did oh, I. You know that? No, I learned it about a week ago when I was doing my studying for the show. Oh, and uh, before, catcher. before, you know, and then you know, he didn't switch to pitching. He switched yeah. from being a left-handed catcher. He switched to first base. No kidding. Pitch. Yeah, and while he played, while he played for Lafayette High School, he was the baseball. Uh, he was their first baseman. The pitcher on that team. I wonder if you remember who the pitcher was on that team. I have no idea. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. He owns the New York Mets. Oh sure, sure. Uh, uh, I think I can't think of his name right. I know who you mean. Fred Wilpon. Fred Wilpon. Fred. That's Fred right. Wilpon. That's right. Unbelievable. When Wilpon, when Wilpon didn't pitch, Sandy pitched. <laughs> but he was normally their first baseman. Uh, first base. How do you like that? Yeah. How do you like that? After being a left-handed <laughs> catcher. Unbelievable. He was don't recruited see many at to all. pitch. Get this. He was recruited to pitch for the Coney Island Sports League. There was a Coney Island Sports League, and I knew – that someone had made a bubblegum card of this, the Brooklyn Park uh -huh. Views, P-A-R-K-V-I-E-W-S, the Park Views. Okay. The Brooklyn Park Views was a semi-pro team in Coney Island, and when Sandy was 17 years of age, they recruited him to pitch for them. Uh -huh. And that was his real, 
that was his real pitching uh, debut. I mean, to speak of. And uh, he attended the University of Cincinnati. We all know that. But right. we didn't know this. He attended the University of Cincinnati, and he was a walk-on for freshman really? basketball team. Freshman basketball. He was oh. completely, get this, Sandy Koufax was completely unknown to the Cincinnati University varsity basketball coach. He had never heard of him before. The first time the coach ever heard of him was when the freshman coach gave him a roster of his team. And he was a walk-on. He, he saw the word, he saw the name Sandy Koufax. He said, who's that guy? Yeah. Never heard of him. Yeah. Now, he was so good. This is how good he was. Koufax was so good that they later gave him a scholarship in the spring of 1954. Basketball scholarship. Basketball? Okay. Yeah. How about that? Um, Here he comes. He's he a walk-on. He offered this Sandy, too? He, he, yeah, but wait a minute. I'm getting to that. He, he was okay. a walk-on for the basketball team. No one even knew who he was. No one recruited him. No one said, hey, there's this guy who plays basketball in Brooklyn for Lafayette High School. We should really try to get him. Nobody knew who he was. He just went to the University of Cincinnati, and he felt like going out for the basketball team, so he was a walk-on. So he came, he tried out for the team, and he made the team. When the varsity coach saw his name on the roster, he didn't know who that was. He knew all the other guys. All the other guys were there on scholarship. Right. He saw right. Sandy's name, and he goes, who the hell is this guy? Then when he saw how good he was, he got a scholarship, basketball scholarship, okay? Amazing. Now, yeah. uh, I'm going to tell you something. That, to me, is amazing because probably <clears throat> Koufax, if he had pursued it, could have been a big, big deal in basketball. Absolutely. Was probably could have been pro. Probably could have been a pro. Sure. Anyway, he went out for the baseball team, and, of course, yeah. he made it. He made the baseball team. And okay. in his only season, he only pitched four, uh, four games. He went three and one with a 281 ERA. 281 ERA in college is not really that impressive. I mean, it's good, but 281 yeah. in college, usually it's like yeah. 181 or 081. But his was 281. He had, did have more Ks than innings pitched, though. He had 51 strikeouts and 32 innings pitched. And there was a guy who was a scout for the Brooklyn Dodgers who happened to be out in Ohio at the time, and he saw Sandy pitch for the University of Cincinnati. And um, he sent in a detailed report on Koufax back to the Dodgers' front office, and that was filed and forgotten. That was filed in yeah. the Dodgers never, never moved on it. Never, never said, "Hey, w wait a minute. W what about this? Uh, we have a scout out there. The scout's name. Well, it's this is a legit story. The scout's name is yeah. Bill Zenser, Z E N S E R. Uh -huh. Bill Zenser. Okay. He scouts Koufax, writes up a glowing report, and files it with the Brooklyn Dodgers front office. Brooklyn Dodgers front office." puts it in the circular file, as they say, loses it, don't, don't even follow up on it, don't talk about it, don't worry about it, nothing, like they never got it. And Kovacs, here's another, here's another thing that is going to uh, knock your socks off. Kovacs had a tryout with the New York Giants at the Polo Grounds. No. Yes. A New York Giants tryout at the Polo Grounds. They invited him. They were not impressed. He also had a tryout. He also had a tryout at Forbes Field for the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Pirates, Pirates, the Pirates heard about him going to the Polo Grounds to try out. They sent him a train ticket. He went out to uh -huh. uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, in Forbes Field, he tried out for the Pirates. Now listen to this story. This is a good story. Yeah. During the Pirates tryout, Colfax fastball broke the thumb of catcher Sam, Sam Naren, the team's no, bullpen coach. 
okay? He breaks the bullpen coach's thumb warming up for his tryout. Now, who was the general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time? Who was it? Branch Rickey. Was it Branch Rickey then? Of course it was. Had he already left, had he already Branch, left Rickey, the Branch Rickey was forced out by O'Malley in 50 or 51. Right. He went to okay. Pittsburgh. Oh, that's right. He took, sure. he took with him. Right. He took with him his right hand man, Clyde Sukforth, the right. former Dodger coach. Okay. Yeah. Well, Branch Rickey is out in Pittsburgh, and he, he's he's at the tryout, and he sees Kofax throwing. Yeah. And he sees that he breaks his catcher's thumb. This yeah. is a true story. It sounds like it's not true, but it's true. It's I checked it out three, three different places. He breaks the wow. catcher's thumb, okay? Uh-huh. Sukeforth said, he, he quotes um, Branch Rickey. Now, no one else but Sukeforth heard Branch Rickey say this, but supposedly Branch Rickey, after he saw Colfax throw during the tryout, he said, yeah. it's the greatest arm I have ever seen. Huh. Now, that's coming from Branch Rickey, not from a well, scout. Why didn't they uh, sign him? Not from a scout. Well, they tried, but by the time the Pirates off- got their offer together, yeah, the Dodgers already had their foot in the door, and uh-huh. Sandy was committed to the Dodgers. Guess who the Dodgers yeah. scout was? The Dodgers scout was Al Campanis. Al Campanis, sure. Al Campanis well, heard about Colfax. Listen to the way Campanis heard about Kovacs. Tell me this isn't serendipity. Campanis hears about Kovacs from a local sporting goods store owner. Really? Campanis goes into a sporting goods store to get some equipment for the youth, you know, like down at the parade grounds, you know, the young rookie Dodger kids, the the not not quite professional kids that are playing down at the parade grounds and stuff. He goes in to get equipment, Campanis yeah. does, at a sporting goods store, and the guy says, hey, by the way, did you ever hear this kid, Koufax? He goes, Koufax? Who's Koufax? He says, Sandy Koufax. He's a local kid here in uh, Brooklyn. He, uh, he had a tryout with the Giants and a tryout with the Pirates, and Branch Rickey uh-huh. says he's the greatest arm he ever saw. So Campanis gets on it right away, all right? And after seeing uh-huh. Kofax pitch, he brings him to – he goes to Lafayette High School and sees him pitch one game, Campanis does. And after the game, he invites Sandy to Ebbets Field. He says, I want you to come to Ebbets Field 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. You're trying out for the Dodgers. He gets – Campanis – Sandy says, okay, I'll be there. Campanis gets Walter Alston and scouting director Fresco Thompson – to watch, along with himself, Campanis. And Campanis assumed the batter's stance while Colfax started throwing okay. in the, you know, on the sideline. He gets in as a batter. Campanis uh-huh. later said, there were two times, this is Campanis speaking now, there yeah. were two times in my life that the hair on my arm stood up straight. The first <laughs> was when I walked into the Sistine Chapel and the second time when I saw Sandy Koufax throw a fastball. <laughs> so needless to say, needless to say, isn't that a great story? Needless to say, story. the Dodgers signed Koufax for 6000 bucks, uh-huh. and they gave him a, a $14,000 bonus. So all in all, he got $20,000. And that's why, that's, why, that's why they couldn't send him down to the minor leagues. Unbelievable. He had to sit on the Dodger bench uh, because when you back in those days, when you signed a bonus baby like that, you couldn't send them right. down to the minors. Right. Right. And that's why Colfax was on the Dodger bench during 1955. He was not on their World Series roster, however. But uh, uh-huh. that's it. 6000 bucks salary oh. and a $14,000 bonus, which came to $20,000. And anything over, I think it was 12000 or something, Major League Baseball made you a bonus baby. So you couldn't be uh-huh. farmed out. Right. Stay with the, you couldn't be farmed out. Uh-huh. Right. That, 
that's the way Major League Baseball at the time it was a very poor system. But that's the way they right. tried to keep a cap on the bonuses because they didn't think people would, you know, teams would give that much money because they didn't want a raw rookie sitting on their bench climbing right. up a spot right. on the 25, 25 man <laughs> roster for the whole season. So that's why they right. did that. Um, anyway, th- that's the deal. But the thing that made me laugh, were, were a, 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 I made a little list in my mind of the things that made me laugh. The first thing that made me laugh was that he started out as a left-handed catcher. The second yeah, thing that, that made me so laugh, funny. the second thing that made me laugh was that he was a first baseman. First baseman. <laughs> yeah. The third, the third thing that made me laugh was that. People always say, oh, he had a basketball scholarship to the University of Cincinnati. Yeah, but that's only half the story. He was a walk-on. He was a walk-on first. And he earned and he got the his scholarship. scholarship. They gave him the scholarship. That's how good he was for the freshman team. The next yeah. thing that made my hair stand on edge was that he tried out for the Giants at the polo grounds. Imagine uh-huh. if the Giants had signed this kid. Oh, oh my lord! Yeah. And then he goes out to Pittsburgh. He goes out to Pittsburgh under the eye of the one and only Branch Ricky. Right. And even though Branch Ricky was very impressed and said it was the greatest arm he had ever seen, the doctor beat the him to it thumb. by signing him up. Yep. Unbelievable! Incredible broke story. The thumb, right? Broke the catcher's <laughs> thumb while he was throwing. <laughs> Out in yeah, Forbes Field. Is that great? Wow. Is that a great story? That's, That's a great just, story. It, it is just incredible. You gotta, you know, when I was reading all this stuff, last week when I was studying up for the show, I know a yeah. lot about Sandy Kopex, but I didn't know these things, right. and I wanted to bring it into the show. These were the things sure. that made me read it over again and again, because I couldn't believe what I was reading. And that's why I wanted to make it, I wanted to, start the show off with saying all of those things. I didn't want to forget any of them. I jotted them down. Right. I thought they were yeah. just absolutely incredible. It's incredible. About Fascinating. Go back. Fascinating. Absolutely. And his last yeah, name was yeah. Braun. B-R-A-U-N. <laughs> his last name was Braun. His mother gets that married. I never and knew either. She marries a guy named Kofax, and he takes the name. Where was that? Uh, Bron, where, what happened with the, the, the father, Bron? What happened there? Did they no, get divorced? He got divorced and he disappeared off the side. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, t- I got to tell you, Peter, I met Sandy in 1955. Cool. On my, on my 10th birthday, uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, it was a really interesting story. We were at the game in Milwaukee. It was my birthday, and Jackie hit a home run, and his wow. rounding third base, he waved to me as like oh. it was me. Then, you know, it was so crazy because we used to we used to go down to the locker room and wait for the players to come out, you know, after the game. Yeah. And it takes 45 minutes to an hour, and, you know, kids are impatient. You're in the bowels of the stadium. There's nothing to yeah. do but great concrete walls. And yeah. you're standing on one foot, you're standing on the other foot. There's nothing to do. So the yeah. only thing we could do was there was a, um, a a big sign on the locker room door that said, Warning, do not enter. Trespassing. You can go to jail. And then they had all this legal jargon. And uh-huh. we used to read that over and over and over just to kill time. Uh-huh. At the time, I could have memorized the whole damn thing. And <laughs> so, one, so Jackie comes out, and he looks at me, and he says, come here. And he takes me by the hand and takes me in the locker room. Wow. And I says, oh, my God, I'm going to jail. <laughs> and he uh, says, uh, oh, no, 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 he says, you're with me. You don't have to worry. And he took a brand-new ball out of a bag. And he took me from locker to locker to locker. All my heroes, Duke Snyder, Pee Wee Reese, Sandy Koufax, was a rookie that year. Um, yeah. There was, you know, Gil Hodges, Carl Ferrillo, Don Duke. They were all patting me on my back, shaking my Roy hand. Roy Campanella. Roy Campanella. I mean, everybody. Jake Pittler was a coach. He signed it. Walter Olson signed it. Everybody signed it. That's great. So, 
I was like, I was like, you know, numb. I was numb, you know. So, and Jackie was so busy getting autographs for me that he actually forgot to sign them all himself. Oh, oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> but I got oh. any other balls from him. But, you know, as kids in those days, we used to play with those balls, Peter. Oh, yeah, we, we were, were stupid, up. right? I know. We were so we were stupid. stupid. We yeah. were stupid. Yeah, you just wasted on the young. I'll tell you, we were really dumb. We were dumb. I remember, we you know, just a, a little off. Off, you know. Yeah, yeah. A, a little <laughs> offshoot of that story. A little offshoot of that story about um, uh, playing with the baseballs that were signed by our heroes. Yeah. When I was a little kid, when I was a little kid, if I had a a, a baseball card of Mickey Mantle a baseball card of Whitey Ford, a baseball card of Yogi Berra, I would trade it to the kid next door who was a Yankee fan, and I would get back, like, Billy Lowe's or Ken Lehman or Rube Walker. And I, I thought I was doing the right thing because I was a Dodger fan. Who wanted those cards? Imagine if I still had those cards. Can you imagine? Oh, My boy. dad had, a, had a, his law office was next to a a candy and tobacco wholesaler, wholesaler. So he used to bring me uh, all the tops cards every year. Uh, I had right. every card from 1951 on. Yeah. And uh, every time I went, because of the bubble gum, every time I went to the dentist, I had about 12 cavities, you know. <laughs> so, and, and they, these were hobby cards, Peter. We put them in teams. I mean, I learned how to alphabetize Everything I can alphabetize instantaneously because uh, of baseball cards. I put them all in alphabetical order. I have pitchers, catchers, infielders, outfielders. And we wrote, you know, if a guy was traded from the Dodgers to the Phillies, I'd cross out Dodgers and put Phillies on it and put them Oh, in. man, oh, man, and, oh, man. Oh. And kids used to put them in the spokes of their bikes. Yeah, I know that. We used riding, to do that, too. We were riding, you'd hear that... <laughs> You'd hear that yeah. I mean, it was a whole different era then. It was, yeah, it was. You know, I mean, imagine every card from 1951 on. Imagine. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my and God. And I have very few left over the years. You know, you move. You, you, my mother threw I bought all mine away. back. I bought all mine back when I became an older guy, you know, when I got some money. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. But, you know, so in 1955, so we used to stay at the Schrader Hotel in Milwaukee. That's where the Dodgers stayed. And so so that, first of all, after that game, after going out in the locker room, we took Jackie to dinner with us. It was my 10th birthday, and he came to have dinner with us. Can you imagine Jackie Robinson singing happy birthday to me? It was That's unbelievable. Amazing. Yeah. Now, this was a... This was a Saturday, uh, Friday night game. So we went, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was a Saturday afternoon game. Okay. So we went out to dinner then with him. And, I mean, it was so great. He signed the menu and everything. So we're staying at the Schrader Hotel. So I went back to the hotel and then went to bed. And then Sunday morning went down for breakfast. And who was sitting in the lobby but Sandy Koufax. Oh. So I started talking to him, and he was telling me how he was bar mitzvah and blah, blah, blah. And I told him I'm a nice Jewish boy from Sheboygan. <laughs> and we talked, we talked a lot. Now, the interesting thing, Peter, about Sandy Koufax was the early years, 55, 56, 57, mm. he was wilder than hell. He was fast. <laughs> But he was wild. Yeah. And I have to admit to you, he was in the bullpen in those days. And I have to admit to you that when they were in the middle of the game and they'd bring him in to pitch, I'd cringe. Mm -hmm. Because you ne never knew what he was going to do. Yeah. And it was, it was amazing. You see, in 1955, he, he didn't play that many games. He was right. two and two. But out of the two and two, two of the games were shutouts. Yeah. <laughs> he had a 3.02 average, your ERA. Yeah. In 56, 
He had a 4.91 ERA. Not good. He was two and four, and no no shutouts. Uh-huh. In '57, he was 3.88 ERA. He was five and four, and had two shutouts. Oh. Uh-huh. In in uh, '58. Four point forty eight was his ERA. Not so great. No. Eleven and eleven. And he had five complete games. Mm-hmm. Of the uh in fifty nine he was four point oh five. Now that was the first year the Dodgers were in LA. And he was eight. Fifty eight fifty eight was the first year there. Yes, I'm sorry, fifty eight. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah. And uh so fifty nine, uh, he was eight and six, with six uh, complete games. In nineteen sixty, he was three point ninety one ERA, eight and thirteen, with seven complete games. Mm-hmm. In sixty one, he was three point fifty two. That's when it started. That's when it started. Eighteen and thirteen. Yeah. Of those games, 15 complete games. Oh, yeah. Had. It's 62. 2.54 ERA, 14 and 7, with 11 complete games. Great. 63, listen to this. A 1.88 ERA. <laughs> he was 25 and 5. Right. Of those 30 games, 20 of them were complete games. Wow. In 64, he had a 1.74 ERA. He was 19 and 5. 15 of those were complete games. Mm -hmm. In 65, here you go. He had a 2.04 ERA. He was 126 and lost 8. And he had 27 complete games. Imagine it. Yep. In 1966, his last season. Remember, he had arm trouble already. Probably his greatest season. 1.73 ERA, 27 and 9, and 27 complete games. Can you imagine? Amazing. Unreal. Amazing. And he decided to quit because of his arm. He had, his arm was hurting him and do you remember a couple years earlier than that, he and Drysdale held out for a yes. better contract? Oh, yeah. Can you imagine? What What are they going to do? they got to pay those guys. I they mean, held out together. They yeah. They held out together jointly. Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine? Buzzy yeah, Bavese was, was the, I don't remember what year that was. Buzzy Bavese but, was the Dodger general manager that was taking yeah. care of that. And yeah. uh, right. he had a, a lot of meetings with them and stuff. And they... They said yeah. he tried to break them apart. Yeah. Bavese tried to break them apart, and they refused to do that. And, uh, no, they refused. They, yeah. they, they said that they would, that in fact, they couple, I think they signed a contract to make a movie or something. And finally, yeah. Bavese gave in and, and, and gave them a lot of money, 150000 a year each or something like that. But when they came back, see, Sandy was in excellent shape. Sandy stayed in shape. Yes. Played he tennis, played great. golf. Drysdale, uh, not so much. Drysdale had a horrible year when they came off of that holdout. Horrible year. Um, but, but I uh, yeah, I definitely story. remember that. I remember that. Yeah. In 1965, he did something that I will never forget. In the World Series, he refused to, he refused to pitch on Young Kipper. Right. First game of the that was first game of the series. Amazing. Yep. In the World Series, it was his turn to pitch, and he refused to pitch because he was Yum Kipper. Can you imagine? I got a story a about that. Like me, like a Jewish boy like me. I got a story like about me. that game. Okay. I got a story about like that game. Go back. Like me. Okay. Hold on one second. Exactly. Step. Like a Jew- exactly. A Jewish boy like me. Uh huh. It was one of the proudest moments of every Jewish kid around, that cool. Yum Kipper was more important than baseball. 
That's great. And it was really, it was really something. Yeah. Go ahead with your story. That's great. Yeah, he was scheduled to pitch the opening game of the World Series, and of course, right. he, he decided not to because of Yom Kippur. Yes. And so Walter Austin turned to Drysdale to open Drysdale, the World Series, right. and Drysdale right. got his got lit up. He he gave up a solo home run, then he gave up a three run home run, and in two two innings plus, I think it was two and the third innings, he had given up four yeah. or five runs, and Austin came out to take him out to replace him. And when Austin got to the mound, Drysdale said to Austin, I bet you wish I was Jewish. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> you know, every rabbi, every synagogue in town in Minneapolis and St. Paul claimed that Sandy Koufax was at their service, at their synagogue. Uh-huh. Right. He never was. He just stayed in his hotel room and said uh-huh. prayers. But every rabbi and every synagogue, oh, he was here. He was at our service. <laughs> but he never was at anybody's service. I mean, That's he right. was such an amazing pitcher. Now, I used to spend a lot of time with him uh, in the Schrader Hotel in the lobby, and we got to be friends. And, you know, he would talk to me about different things, how I was doing in school, and he knew I was friends with Jackie and all that stuff. And... uh he, and he loved Jackie. Jackie and he were very close. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jackie being uh, African-American and Sandy being Jewish, um, you know, they could support each other. Um, and uh, he admired Jackie for what he went through. So this guy, he had 137 complete games. Can you imagine? Amazing. And 40 of them were shutouts. 40 shutouts. And four no-hitters. Yeah. Imagine? Yeah. Unbelievable. He was the first pitcher to have four no-hitters. That's right. He was. Yeah. He was amazing. And, you know, we're talking all about this because this this past week, uh, Sandy Koufax became 82 years old. Uh, yep. He celebrated his 82nd birthday. So we certainly want to wish Sandy a happy birthday and many, many more. And I'll tell you, if anybody I look at, when I look at him, there is no way in hell that he looks 82. He I'm is just going to say shape. the same thing. You know, no you took way the words in right hell. out of my mouth. He That's looks right. great. He, he looks, looks so really, good. really great. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's unbelievable. Stayed in shape. Yeah. Stayed in shape all those years. The only thing that all changed from Sandy Koufax is that his hair turned white. Right. That's right. That's it. Other than That's that, it. he looks fabulous. Yeah. He looks great. You notice every time that Rachel Robinson comes to Dodger Stadium mm-hmm. and there's a ceremony of any sort, Sandy Koufax is there walking her out. Yes, uh, they're very I do notice that. They're very close. Did you notice that? Yeah. I do notice that. So, I've been noticing yeah. that for four or five years. Um, yep, absolutely. I saw, I saw Koufax pitch um, about, let's see. I saw him pitch in 62 and 60, I mean live, not on television. I saw him pitch yeah. many, many times on television. I saw him right. pitch at the Polo Grounds against the Mets twice in 62 and twice in 63. I saw him pitch yeah. against the Mets at Shea Stadium in 64 and saw him pitch against the Mets at Shea Stadium in 65. So I saw him pitch a total of about seven games. Yeah. He lost He lost only one of those games that I saw him. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, he lost one of those games. That, that was his heyday. That's when he was doing well. He was really. Yeah, good. Hawk Taylor hit a home run off him or something. Yeah. I mean, nobody could touch him. Nobody could touch him. He the was, thing that amazed me about him, when I saw him pitch live, I had pretty good seats. I never sat. Like way the hell out, you know. Oh, I never did either. You know, I I, I I always had decent seats, and I could yeah. I could see uh, very well from where I sat. Yeah. And yes, he was fast, but the thing that made him amazing was the thing that makes Kershaw amazing, and that is yeah. that that twelve to six curveball. Yeah, he had the that twelve to six that curveball. Was... People actually yeah. go. When he would throw it, and the batter would take it, 
and the umpire would call it a strike, the crowd actually went, ooh. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you, right. you think they would go, you think they would go, ooh, for his fastball, but they did not. No, it was the they did not ball. go, ooh, for his fastball. They went, it's ooh, snap, when he threw cur- those the curveballs. Amazing. That's right. And speaking of curveballs, and yes. speaking of Sandy Koufax, Yes. In the 1965 World Series, in the seventh game, Kopax had no curveball. His curve wasn't working. No, he won that game. No, he won that game on sheer fastballs, fastballs. sheer gut. That's right. Complete yep. game, seventh game, won it on all fastballs. Couldn't throw the he curve. The curve wasn't down. breaking. Couldn't get it over the plate. Threw all fastballs. Yep. Yep. Unbelievable. He was something. He was. And he was. Speaking of birthdays, my granddaughter's 15 today. Oh, and, great. Uh, I'm just going to go in pretty soon to a party for her. Uh, she was okay. my second grandchild. Yeah, you got to get in there. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah, you got to get in there and give her a kiss. Yeah. Give her a hug and a kiss. I, yeah, yeah sure 15 will. is a great age. Great age. Fifteen's a great age. You bet. All right, listen. Thank you for your contribution. Okay. Right, thank you, buddy. I appreciate your contribution. How are you feeling, by the way? I feel great. I feel great. There you go. I'm That's off, what we I'm all like the to hear. <laughs> there you go. I'm off the deep. Yeah. Let's, let's, I feel let's say I, I'm safely – I'm safe to say that everyone who heard you say that it has a smile on their face because – you're well loved uh, by many, 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 many people in the, in the uh, Facebook uh, area and with the Comfortably Zone Radio. And to hear you say that you feel great and that everything is perfect uh, brings a smile to all our faces. Thank you for the contribution you, tonight. Uh, Thank you. Have Happy a good time. New Year to you and Linda. Happy New Year to you and your family. Get into that birthday party. Have a good time, That's and uh, okay. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you through the week. Thanks. Good night, Ron. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Bye-bye.